Hello, I'm Chris Lemaire. I'm a programmer at the American Cinematheque, and I'm very happy to welcome you to our virtual Q&A for News of the World. Uh, today, we are thrilled to welcome seven of the brilliant members of the creative team behind the film. Our, our moderator is Jim Hemphill, who is a film historian and director, as well as a longtime friend of the American Cinematheque. So thank you to tuning in. Uh, I hope you enjoy the following conversation. Thanks. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Jim Hemphill, and uh, I'm very excited to welcome you to this News of the World panel. I'd like to ask all the panelists to unmute themselves and turn their video on now, and uh, I will introduce everybody. Um, all right, everybody popping up here. So, um, so uh, let's see, is Helena here? Well, I'll introduce. Uh, everybody as I see them coming up. Uh, we've got, so obviously we've got co-writer and director, Paul Greengrass. We've got editor, William Goldenberg. We've got, uh, sorry, costume designer, Mark Bridges. Production designer, David Crank. And composer, James Newton Howard. And uh, I think uh, Helena will be joining us momentarily. So I guess we could just get started. And, you know, Paul, you've got this great group here of collaborators, a couple of whom, uh, you know, Mark and Billy, you've worked with before. Everyone else, I think, is new to you. And I'm curious, you know, I get the impression that you're the kind of director who really likes to get a lot of ideas from everyone around you and, and play with them and incorporate them into rewrites. And the whole thing's kind of constantly evolving. So. What are the most important factors that you look for when you are assembling a team like this? And then once you've got them, what kind of environment do you try to create to inspire their best work? Well, I mean, you look for the best people and luckily with all those people, you know, Darius and Mark, and I'm not going to name everybody because they're all fantastic, you know, and I was very, very lucky to to have them come and make the movie with me. Uh, I mean, what you want is people who've got strong ideas and a strong point of view and people who challenge you and have their own ideas, you know. I mean, you also like them to listen to what you're trying to do, be sympathetic with what you're trying to do, but everybody does their best work when they're challenged and, uh, and pushed. And, uh, you know, I believe in the power of the collective you know, um, we're strong together and you have to try and create an atmosphere where everybody makes their contribution in a free and fearless way on the basis that I make more mistakes by breakfast on day one than everybody else put together makes in the whole movie. I mean, that's my sort of fundamental point yeah, of it. And- uh, Hi. <laughs> hello, Helena. Hi, sorry, I, I had trouble to get in, but now I'm here. Okay. Hello. Hi. Hi. Well, since Helen is here, you know, Paul, I'm curious if, you, you know, when I talked to you a few days ago, you said that initially you thought your biggest challenge on this movie was going to be finding the actress to play the female lead. And then it turned out not to be a challenge. Um, how did you find Helena and how did you know she was the right person for the part? Uh, well, I knew I wanted a German actress, and uh, and then uh, Gail Mutrix sent me System Crasher, which uh, which Helena was in, which if you've not seen, is a wonderful German film, and Helena is absolutely superb in it. And I watched it, and I'd sort of just started to look, really, and, you know, was thinking it was going to be an arduous long journey, and literally as soon as I watched that film, I thought, well what are the chances of there being two young actresses of, of that age in Germany? I mean, the truth is it was always going to be Helena. And we met in London with a, Helena and her mum, and she was fantastic. She was fantastic from day one to the end. So it, it was, I can take no credit for it. It's the credit is all Helena's. Well, Helena, the, you know, the biggest compliment I can pay you is that when I watched the movie, I felt like, you know, you seemed like you were playing yourself. It was like Paul went back in a time machine to the 1870s to get you. And I'm curious, what kind of preparation did you do in terms of learning like the Kiowa language and immersing yourself in this part? What kinds of, of research and, and prep did you have to do before you shot the movie? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, sure. First of all, I read the script and uh, I thought it was great. I thought it was uh, a fun story to do, probably. And then for me as a German girl in America and then speaking English on set and Kiowa uh, was quite uh, nice to hear that I may play that role. And um, yeah, I had, I we started to have lessons in Kiowa three weeks before the movie started. Every day, one and a half hour after I did school uh, with Laura Watkins, which is a wonderful person. I really like her. And Dorothy helped me too. She's one of the <laughs> oldest, or the oldest Kiowa member um, of the Kiowa tribe. So that was great to meet her. And um, yeah, I learned that. And sure, I learned about the culture while learning the language. I um, got to know many Kiowa. Uh, members who really like lived like you'd expected like sitting on the fire and singing around and stuff which was fun like to hear their story how it was in those times back then and um yeah I learned a lot through the movie about Indians and Native Americans and and what was your relationship with Tom Hanks like and how did that kind of um influence the way that you played Johanna the way that you, you know how did your real life relationship with Tom Hanks influence the way you guys played your relationship on screen well I mean on screen I think we're like a, sorry especially at the beginning um we are not really close like I'm trying to ignore him but I think what you see on screen which is going like or coming later on is really the relationship we got in real life. Uh, yeah, in real life, we met, I think two days or three days before the movie started. I don't quite remember, I think so. Um, and yeah, I liked him from the first day. He was funny, he's nice. Uh, he's a gentleman, like everybody says, which is true, he's sympathetic. And just, yeah, just a great guy to shoot with. And I think I got the right one to play that role with because yeah, he's just a great actor. Sure, I mean, yeah, obviously. And um, yeah, so in real life, I mean, yeah, we're very good friends now. We talk almost every day, either on phone or we email each other or something like that. So I think at the ending, especially you really see the relationship on screen uh, like it was in real life. And yeah, we just, I think, made a great duo in this movie. Well, and Billy, you know, for you, you're editing a movie here that's dependent you know, almost entirely on these two characters. How do the choices the actors make guide your decisions in the cutting room? And how do you decide in any given scene what the point of view is going to be? Because in some scenes, it's sort of more from kids, some it's more from Johanna's, sometimes you're kind of shifting between them. Well, I mean, luckily for me with this, on this film, you know, I have actors of Tom's and, and Helena's, uh, you know, brilliance you know that it, it makes it a little bit easier you don't have to manufacture moments they're there for you you just have to find um you know the best ones the ones that are telling the truth of a scene and and sort of lean into those i mean uh, there's so many scenes where there's non-verbal communication so you know oftentimes you have to sort of manufacture that but with this film with these actors i was able to um just go with what they did really and, and find those moments of reality and hang with them um, because there are so many times in this film like I said where it, they're not speaking but you but their eyes and their, their gestures are telling the whole story and you know Paul as far as point of view Paul and I early on you know talked about that a lot and and we you know obviously we decided that the film is basically from kids point of view Obviously, there are times where that's not true, and Helena, you know, Joanna, Johanna's in the cabin where she's, you know, her family was taken. Um, obviously, it's her point of view, but m most of the time, we decided that it would be from kids' point of view, and most of the film is that way. But there are times where, you know, the, the film itself dictates where where you where you want to focus and what that point of view should be. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, another interesting thing about the movie is, you know, in terms of point of view, is that it is such an intimate character study, but it's also such a kind of, you know, sweeping epic. And David, one of the things I love about your production design is that it's got that sort of sense of sweeping spectacle, but then there's so many wonderful tiny details that build the world. And I'm curious, where do you even start thinking about the visual language for a movie of this scope? And what were some of the biggest challenges for you setting out on it? Well, I think um, 
<clears throat> our biggest one was it was such a long journey from start to finish. And I think that was one thing that was very um, important, I think, to Paul and to Darius. We, we had to be able to show a difference as we went so that we understood the length of it. And, we under, and, and Paul and I talked at the beginning about how every place they go has to mean something and be something. Otherwise, it's just repetitive. So that, because we were in Santa Fe and not in Texas, that was probably the biggest thing. And it was trying to find and identify these areas that replicated landscape that would have been similar to what we had. But, um, and we kind of collected a lot of landscapes for Paul to, to look at and use and figure out how he wanted to put them into the film. And then, you know, the other half was what we, what we were doing in these towns. And we really, we only used two towns to do everything. So it was, it was an interesting project to try to figure out how to, to get them, squeeze the most out of those two towns, which had been there for a while. Yeah, well, I love the way like the different spaces in the movie kind of, like, as you were saying, sort of tell the story and move it forward. Like even the different environments where Tom Hanks is reading the news, you know, those environments kind of change throughout the movie. And it's, I was wondering, you know, were you sort of uh, trying to use to sort of, sort of create a progression with those spaces to tell us something about the movie and his journey? Yeah, as much as with the towns, I mean, we started in a place that really was kind of a, it was a warehouse without people and it was kind of a dead place. And then you move to what would have been the town space, which was the church. And then you move to a more sophisticated space in, in Dallas. And then you move, I think the first time we talked about the reading in Durand, it was like in a, inside in a saloon. And I think we all thought that was a bit cliche. So Paul decided he wanted it outside, which was added a nice element of danger and at night. And then he wanted to go full circle back to a similar space for the last reading, but it was actually a space where something happened instead of just being a warehouse, it was a, a shop. So it kind of had a little more life and light to it. So mm -hmm. we did kind of try to think those out carefully how we did those. Mm -hmm. When I was curious, Paul, watching the movie again, I, I really appreciated the scene, the scenes where he's reading the news, uh, the performances of the extras of all the people who are listening to him are really great, you know? I mean, cause it's like, you think of those scenes and you think of Hanks, but you, uh, you really create a really plausible, realistic world around him. What kinds of direct, what kind of direction did you give to the people who were just listening to the news in those scenes? Uh, well, we tried to involve them. I mean, first of all, I think the AD team on this film did a remarkable job uh, in finding those people. You know, they were really, really carefully and meticulously cast. And, you know, the truth is that that supporting artists are just as important as main artists because they create a truth across the frame, you know, and, and with all that wonderful work that, that uh, David and Darius were doing to, to make these things look so beautiful, you had to have the right people in the frame and, and then Mark had to dress them as, as perfectly as he did. And then I think collectively, Look, I think it was a happy shoot. I mean, these guys will tell you better than I, but it felt like a very happy collective shoot. And we were purposeful and we didn't have, I mean, we had appropriate resources, but we didn't have, you know, limitless amounts of resources. And I think that in a funny way helped us. It made us lean and mean and creative. But, uh, but I think that the adventure of making a Western intoxicated all of us it certainly did me and you know so I think if you're a happy group with a collective spirit a powerful collective spirit you know forging forward to the the film that we're all trying to articulate then it's very easy I think with your supporting artists to create a culture that makes them feel involved and they were you know we were shooting I mean those big scenes for instance in Durand where people are with us you know the best part of a week you can really involve people because they've got to perform properly in every element of the frame you know and they did. Well uh, Darius Paul mentioning you know how much fun it was to do a western um, you know, another thing I love about this movie is it delivers the pleasures of like a classical John Ford Western, but it also does feel fresh and immediate and new. And I'm curious for you, what, how much were you influenced by classical Westerns and in what ways did you want to deviate from them? Well, obviously you are always, because we all grew up in Westerns, my generation. <clears throat> uh, so 
you're very aware of it, but now watching them again, you see they're kind of jaded, right? So you're trying to find something modern. And, uh, you know, my approach is always to keep it as, as realistic as possible. Just put yourself like, imagine if we were there. So that's why you have a lot of kerosene lamps. That's why lighting is very simple, very minimalistic. It's all about, I think the whole movie from my perspective was about restraint, which Paul, partially inspired me and I just went along with it. Uh, yep. like there's no there's no crane shots, there's nothing really. In the very end, we, we decided to do some helicopter shots to open up the movie, but everything else is handheld, steady cam, very kind of from from the Tom Hanks perspective and and capturing everything as simply as possible. So, and be always open and flexible to capture moments that are, you know, uh, that you cannot completely control and direct. That's why with, with Tom and, and Helena, we use two cameras all the time. So the performance, whatever we did was captured instantly. Mm -hmm. And with all the speeches, we used three cameras and there was always one that was focusing on the crowd, capturing it, you know? Because the best thing with crowd is like, less you, less you basically tell them, less they know that it's being filmed. More natural react. Yeah, I mean, I believe it. He's being a bit modest there, Jim. The truth is the movie is absolutely stunningly beautiful, you know. Uh, but it is simple. And, I mean, that's it is simple. And, you know, and we had a good push and pull, didn't we? Because we came to it from, you know, from our different perspectives. And I remember saying to Darius, you've got to make it different for me because I'm, you know, I'm known for doing a certain thing and I want to do something different. And and you did. You pushed me and and Thanks. and and gave me this beautiful film and and I can't thank you enough. Well, I thank everybody, but... but we kept, we kept your... You <laughs> okay, but we did keep your, still your... Yeah, uh, yeah. but it was fun. No, that, narrating that, and telling the story, which, you know, I always respect in your previous movies, so... For we sure. kept a little... Yeah, it's a good, it was a good combination, good hybrid that came out of it. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah, no, I, I would say as a fan of both of yours, I thought you guys, it was really interesting watching the movie and seeing what you both brought to each other from your own particular filmmaking styles. I thought it was it was kind of a cool example of the sum being greater, you know, greater than the parts or whatever the, the saying is. Um, now, Mark, you and Paul have worked together before. And one thing I know about both of you is that you're very rigorous when it comes to research. So... I'm curious what kind of research you did to find references and sources for your costumes and, and what did you learn from that research that dictated uh, the way you dress these characters? You know, I always try to go to uh, primary research from the period. There's not a ton of photographs at that time. Uh, so we're looking at newspapers, whatever photographs, Harper's Weekly for caricatures. Um, yeah. <laughs> Books. I'm old fashioned. I still use books, <laughs> and uh, because there are things that aren't on the internet, and uh, you know, just put together. We had a meeting. I put together images that I thought told our story, and how we could do it, and then of course sent that to Paul, and you know, he chose what struck a chord with him, and we ran with that, and, and just tried. Having worked with Paul before, I know that he's very uh, much uh, wants it to seem real, very much uh, texture, touchable, dirt, whatever you can get in to make it feel real. And so we're happy to do it, thrilled to do it. I had an amazing person doing my dying and my breakdown for all the stuff that we made for Tom and, and Helena uh, brand new had to look lived in, so did that. And what, um, you know, t tell me a little bit about your approach to Tom's uh, wardrobe specifically. Like, what were you trying to, to sort of convey about his character? You know, I think there's a sense of uh, being uh, a, a little earlier in time, his, the shape of his frock coat and his vest and his shirts and the way he wears his clothes was probably from 20, 25 years earlier than what would be in vogue at the time. So there is a sense of, of history to what he wears when he's reading clothes. And then of course, the practical aspect of, uh, of getting through miles and miles of wilderness in what he wears uh, 
it for the road. And, uh, you know, also the really telling the story about how little he is able to carry with him because of how he travels and how he works and, and using those clothes in different ways as, as the stories changes and his situation changes. So that, that's what we did for Tom. And of course, a lot of texture and, and things that felt foreign to the contemporary eye, but still were accessible to the audience, you know, so you felt like you were in a specific time and place. Uh, now, James, I know that you and Billy have worked together before, but I think this is your first time working with Paul. Uh, what kinds of conversations did the three of you have about the approach to music and how early in the process did those discussions begin? Um, pretty early. I mean, I flew out and met with Paul and Billy on set, I think it was November uh, of 19, um, which happens also to be the last time I set eyes on Paul face to face. So. <laughs> All the work we did, of course, was over Zoom and um, different uh, technologies that we used to play back music and talk about it. But, um, you know, I, I think Paul was talking a great deal about what, what Darius said, which was restraint. You know, that this was, uh, we, were, we were all getting incredible thrills and goosebumps and, and, and feeling incredibly fortunate sitting out there in the middle of the New Mexico desert with wagons and extras and people around making a Western. So the whole thing, and as Paul said, it's true, it was a very happy set. Um, I think we talked really about the evolution of this character, about defining this, this kid character, who is he and how do, we, how, do we, how do we do that? And what instruments are you going to use? And uh, Paul talked about how broken the country was, you know, that the landscape was broken, that the people were broken, that there were incredible divides and, um, and you know, how do we make even the music sound less, less certain, less sure of itself, you know, that it's really not, not up on its feet yet. And so we, we talked about the idea of a broken consort really as being the center really of the score. And it was, it's really quite a quiet score for the most part. Um, and I think that, you know, Billy is an extraordinary editor and we've worked together several times before. It's really relatively easy to, I'm, I'm gonna say everything fits when, you, when you're trying to write music to the, to the scene. It's, and I don't mean it's easy, but it's, you don't run up against all of a sudden this brick wall that doesn't make any sense editorially. And that, that helps enormously. So I think it was a very quiet score. We, we Paul would say after a couple of months, work, you know, you, I don't feel like you found the voice of the score yet. And I would keep on looking and then we would have moments of discovery. And, um, and then we took a long break from during the COVID first shutdown and came back and he and I, we, we all of us together just did one final blast through the whole thing. And I think we kind of nailed it then. Mm -hmm. But really for the most part, it is a quiet score. Um, mm -hmm. It's to flex its muscles in a couple of little spots, but um, really, it's just a joy to, to look at those images all day and get paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and is there, for you and Paul working on that score, I mean, is there a lot of kind of trial and error? I mean, were, were there versions of the movie where you were going for a more, you know, a larger score and then had to pull it back? Or, you know, how, how many different ways do you try things? Well, we tried lots of different ways. And I mean, I've, just the opening with Kid putting on his shirt and looking out at the, at the first crowd he's going to read the news to, I may have done close to 20 versions of that. Now they weren't 20 wholesale versions like you know, completely different, but they were very different in terms of their ultimate sensibilities. And, and I think what, what I kept doing, what I feel I kept doing, which was incorrect was projecting the wrong emotion about this guy. And I think I was projecting sometimes sadness as opposed to aloneness. And that doesn't sound like a big deal, but I think it took a while to get to, to where we were at a place where you really felt that this, this guy is a man apart, that he is not, that he's a wounded soul and that he is lonely and that you're in the middle of this frigid winter in Wichita Falls. And you do it very simply with just a couple of fiddles and guitars. So that took a while to get. Mm -hmm. um, well, I've got a bunch of uh, 
questions coming in here from the audience. So I'm going to sort of throw it out here. Uh, let's see. This first question says, for Paul, what is an example of prep work that you do on every film that makes your job easier during production? Hmm. Well, I guess get, get the screenplay in the best possible shape that you can. Uh, so that it speaks to everybody, you know. Um, you know, not too long. On the other hand, not too short, I think. You've got to have some options and some roads to explore. But I think... I think the key, if I'm really honest, is when you're working with all these people here tonight who are such, you know masters of their craft you just got if you feel like you just got to get out of the way and let let them speak to you let them articulate the film and you know i, I don't mean that with enforced modesty you know your job is to try and articulate the overall picture uh but you know to be surrounded by all this talent, to, to see it breathe life into the film in all these areas and see it slowly come to life was a magical experience for me. And that's really how you do it. You try and get your screenplay in the decent order and then hire the best people you can and trust them. <laughs> you know what I mean? That sounds easy, but that sounds, but that's the key. It's the key, you know? Uh, the next question I have from the audience is for Helena. What do you love most about acting? Um, well, I get that question very often. What do I love most? And I think there are so many things you can love about acting, like discovering new countries, get to know new people, get to know new languages, and get to work with animal um, or I don't know, stuff really get to play roles you really want to do or wanted to do and discover yourself. But I think for me, the greatest thing is actually like the kick you get when it says like, now go and do the scene and then it starts and you're just like, you have butterflies in your stomach and you're just like, oh my God, no, I'm going to be uh, shooting this scene or this scene, I'm going to meet this one and this one. I think for me, it's really like the cake. It's, yeah, it's just, I just love it. Every scene is, and, well, every scene is again, very exciting. And every day when I get to set, doesn't matter which movie I do, I'm always excited and nervous because you don't know what you're going to do this day or discover. So, yeah, I think it's really like this adrenaline kick you get when you shoot a scene. Mm -hmm. uh, the next audience question, this is uh, for Mark, but probably a few other people can address it as well. Can you discuss the color palette that was used for the look and feel of the film and how the costumes helped accentuate that look? Hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I think as far as color palette, uh, there are things out there in the world that it was a very natural time. We just tried to keep things very uh, natural, not a lot of chemical colors involved. Um, you know, I think we didn't want to make a, a, a brown movie per se. You know, um, what we did try to do was do different, as David was talking about, uh, give a different character to each of the towns that we went to to show their uh, economy or uh, to show how sophisticated they are. So it, while doing those characteristics, I think that the palette came in and, you know, we just tried to use interesting combinations. I often do things like mix cool and warm together because I feel in one outfit because I feel like it it, it seems more real and more random, yet is still kind of harmonious. So that's that's pretty much where we were going for for that. Yeah. David, I saw you nodding. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about your sort of uh, philosophy when it came to color in the movie? Well, I mean, I think everything he said is very true. I, mean, I think it was kind of town by town. You tried to give it a little bit of a push, but I think we had this town, and I think the biggest thing we need to do is we had to calm it down. 
so that it didn't jump forward. And I don't think in, in terms of architecture and things, there really, there wasn't a lot of color and there wasn't a lot of interest in, in trim work, et cetera. So I think, you know, the, the, we really were trying to keep it as mean as possible without it becoming drab. Mm -hmm. But I think people were pretty much just hanging on at that time. And it was after the war, the state had no money, people hadn't any money. So I think um, ours is probably even more simple than his. I think you'd probably see the color more in, in clothing than you would. But I think, you know, for a long period, it was just pretty, pretty monochromatic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we kind of, we had to work with what we had there too. And I think that was, and it was actually quite fortunate. I think it forced us into a nice palette that we had. Uh, the next audience question I have, uh, they would like everyone to talk about how difficult was the mountain shootout scene, uh, both technically and from the actor's point of view and from an editing point of view, what was it like putting that scene together? Um, well, from an editing point of view, it was, first of all, it was the most fun I've had on the film in terms of, you know, just all the different just you know parts of the, of the scene coming together at different times. and. A lot of it was first unit, there was some second unit, you know, um, and it was shot over a couple of weeks. So we're, it was one of those, yeah. you didn't have time, you didn't have the, the advantage of cutting it all to one time. It was always, it was layering and layering and layering. And then again, a lot of nonverbal storytelling, which is always really fun. And, um, you know, moments between uh, Tom and Helena that, you know, where he discovers just how clever she is and has this moment of, realization when he, she comes back with the dimes and how that's all going to work and all that's really challenging and you know having the challenge of making a horse and a wagon look like it's going much faster than it is and and it's just the thing when you're you know thinking about uh, you know in, in, in film school when I was an editor you know uh, learning how to be an editor the idea to shoot to cut a shootout in a western directed by Paul Greengrass and shot by Darius Walski is like you know the, the idea that I got to do that it was just like, you know, a kid in a candy store. It was, it was really fun. And, um, and the best part of it is it's a storytelling, you know, scene too. So it's not just an action for action sake scene. And, and you know, those are the best action scenes, of course, are ones that advance the story. And it advances Tom and Helena's relationship in a way that, you know, sets off the rest of the film on the right, on the right you know, foot. So it, it was just a joy to do. And what kinds of conversations are going on between the editing room and Paul and the set? Like you said, it took a couple of weeks to shoot that scene. So are you, as you are working, are you communicating with Paul? And is there sort of, uh, is the scene evolving based on those discussions, Paul? 100%, you know. Um, you know, Barris is talking to Billy, you know, it's a, it's a, it's, I do believe in, in, you know, holistic filmmaking, not linear film. We, we, you know, we're a team and we're all in it together. And that was a big piece of the film and a complicated piece. And and of course, you don't get it right first time. You know, sometimes you have to go back on yourself and say, actually, you know, we could do that little piece a bit better. And uh, you know, uh, and it was very physically demanding. You know, we had to go up those you know bluffs and some of them yet to go up on ropes and there were quite a lot of safety issues and a lot of rattlesnakes for company which was fun but 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 persistence and, and an adventurous spirit and uh you know billy did a fantastic job and uh and and Helena was fantastic in that because that's not easy to be up there all day, is it, Helena? I mean, you were amazing, I think, on all that stuff. Well, yeah. as, as was Tom. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was great because it was fun to go out with ropes. Um, like when you see those pictures or um, those future films and the internet, how we like needed to really like climb up there. Um, all the sound guys, the camera and everything uh, was uh, very funny to do. But yeah, it wasn't easy sometimes because you needed to run up there or something like that. You really needed to watch out for rocks and not to fall down, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, but I liked it up there. It was great doing like going every day a little bit higher. Uh, yeah, it was fun to do. Well, Darius, talk, talk about some, I mean, the, the the complexities of shooting that sequence. Were well, amazing. I mean, one thing I have to say is that 
that's the location was was the hardest to find. And I remember that you didn't settle for anything until we found the perfect place. And yeah, that's good to you, Paul, because there was a lot of them logistics and stuff and this and and we found the hardest one to do it. At and and we did it. Yeah, it was a lot of climbing, hiking up and. My operators are very fit, and my crew was just doing an amazing job taking all this equipment. And even being open at the last minute—I mean, if you think of the of that last piece of the shootout when they're in that, you know, Tom underneath Tom was underneath, and and uh, Alme was up above. Literally, you and I went out and found that sort of I know. Uh, lunchtime. I think it was on on the. We had a couple of days shoot, so that I was started very very late because it was. Just do you remember we walked around the corner and went, that's perfect. Like, you know, it's gonna be there. That was yeah, that was wonderful because like immediately we knew this is this is it. Yeah, yeah. But there are two uh, levels when Tom is on the knees and, and yeah. yeah, that was no, but I'm talking about the one before when they when when they're on top of the mountain, the, the shootout. Also, I want to say something about the great thing about this shootout is it's always about the bullets you don't fire. Because you know, when when you look at a lot of action movies, people just fire at will and this Uzis they have cartridges they can fire thousands of bullets and stuff. And the fact that there's so little bullets in the whole story makes the whole thing much more dramatic, you know. Mm-hmm. And very special. It's all about it's it's like with music, it's about notes you don't hear, you know. These are the best ones, you know. Sure. So that was very dramatic, very funny and the you capture you took full advantage of it. And great, uh, yeah. It's funny, it wasn't that it wasn't that I didn't have to do that much climbing or I, I, in the editing room. There was not a lot. I didn't have to go up any hills or any mountains. It was, it was very easy for me. I, it, I don't remember being very strenuous. So, no, but it's 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 a huge pleasure to 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 have you know main actors with incredible vista behind them, and it's all real. There's no blue screen. It's just such a mm. such a always gives me such a satisfaction. You know, yeah. it's, all those action movies I made with you know, a lot of technology now. And this was all for real, yeah. Uh, the next question is a question for Paul. It says, this film reminded me a bit of Anthony Mann's Winchester 73. Uh, did you draw influence from any particular classic Westerns or studio era directors? Yeah, I mean, that that less so that more the searches, I guess, would be the the, the one that I remember when I read um, the Paulette Giles's novel uh, and Luke Davis's uh, excellent first draft. It, 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 there was something about it, you know. In the searches, John Wayne's character goes out into the desert and searches for the girl, right. and that's the movie. In this, kid Tom Hanks's character finds the girl at the beginning of the movie and has to try and bring her home or to at least what he thinks is her home so it's it's the searches in reverse which i really liked and uh i did have as i think we all did you know i think when you make a western you're gonna have ford and sturgis and all these guys in your minds because they're the they're the great architects of the genre and uh and you're aware, of course, that you're scrambling up on the shoulders of a giants, you know, of giants and or walking in the footprints of giants. I don't know which is the right metaphor, but you know what I mean. And uh, I think we all felt that. Um, but the important thing is to relish that, not to be intimidated. You know, it's it's all you can do in filmmaking is put your pebble in a great wall of filmmaking that goes on before you arrive and will go on long after you stop that's the kind of right attitude and you just try and and do the best you can and honor the tradition and try and do something maybe slightly fresh with it mm-hmm. well and James in terms of the music when you're scoring a movie like this that's sort of in a classical genre are you thinking about the composers of past films like this or those kind of movies or those influences on you or is it more just about responding to this particular piece of material? Well I, I think it's wholly about responding to this material however at the same time one can't help as Paul said to have stood on the shoulders of giants who have come before so 
you know, without question, I mean, every Western I've watched, every movie I've seen, every music I've heard, you know, become, we, we distill that. We distill in our own creative energy what has come before. But I never intentionally wanted to replicate uh, anything before. In fact, I was spending a great deal of time on in that particular scene, the shootout scene, which uh, was a big challenge for me as well, because when I first looked at it, I thought, oh my God, this thing is 16 minutes long. It scared, scared me to death. And it was the first thing I started working on. Um, and I, I, I tried to create an action sequence in the front. There's, there's really only action per se in the, in the first bit. And then they're, then they're sort of in their position, strategic positions. But I tried to get the action stuff, created all these sounds so that it didn't have a, didn't sound like a, anything trying to get to the place where it doesn't sound like what you've heard before. But, um, you know, thematically, I, I guess I would probably veer toward Alfred Newman and how the West was won. Mm -hmm. When I think of a great Western theme, that's, that's sort of where I go or Elmer. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, other than that, I was just, just trying to score the movie in front of me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we've got time for one last question. And uh, the last one we have here is actually for David. Uh, it's a question about if you used uh, CGI set extensions. And if you did, if you could talk about that. Yeah, I think the other two can help me with this because it was all done after I was there. <laughs> <laughs> we did talk about it at the beginning. So we had kind of an idea of what we were going to need. And especially since we were doing three towns in one. So, but I think we very, Darius and I worked really hard at the beginning to figure out how you would approach each town and what you would see and what you would say for the next town. So that was kind of mapped out kind of carefully at the beginning, but we always knew we, we, we would need it. And I think what was really nice about what they did was it, it's really kind of all around the edges and it's very fast, but, it's, but it set the tone very quickly about what the difference was in the town, but you never lingered on it. And then most of really what, they shot was real stuff, which was nice. But so I think it was kind of used in a really wonderful way that it, it kind of opened it up in a way that it wasn't so obvious. I mean, the biggest one really was going into San Antonio, which they did an incredible job on the, that, that kind of opening square. But I think they used it kind of the way we were using everything else. It was very kind of gentle and and, and not- the Supermarket case. car parks have never looked so period. <laughs> <laughs> loads of dirt and you got yourself San Antonio. <laughs> I mean it, it is such a great before and after to see Tom riding that horse on a little trail of dirt and only a parking lot and storage containers and then even cutting it you it's so hard to imagine and then you get the first couple of, uh, of uh, you know passes on on this town and you just can't believe it. I mean as long as I and been editing, you never get cease to be amazed about what those things look like when they come in. I mean, it's so photo real. And I think that's the hardest thing to do is make something photo real. And like David was saying, make it just kind of blend in where it doesn't show itself. You know, it doesn't break the audience's, you know, concentration on what they're looking at, it doesn't pull them out of the film. It's it, it, Ronnie Rodriguez who's our visual effects supervisor. He just did a beautiful job of, of making it all feel seamless. All right. Well, uh, we are out of time. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today and thank everybody out there for watching. And uh, I'm going to throw it back to Chris at the Cinematheque. Thanks, Jim. And echoing what he just said, thank you to all our panelists here for, for joining us today and also sharing such a beautiful movie with us. Uh, and thank you, Jim, for leading such a fantastic, fascinating uh, discussion here. Uh, to our audience, thanks again for tuning in uh, and for sending in your amazing questions. Uh, we'll, we'll see you again tonight for our Q&A for MLK FBI. Uh, and that's it, so have a great day. Thank you.